Hi, this is Aharon Dubinsky at Breslev Israel in Yerushalayim. I'm speaking to you today from the Beit Knesset of Breslev Israel in the beautiful city, the holy city of Yerushalayim, the beautiful land of Israel, under the direction of our beloved rabbi and spiritual guide, Rabbi Shalom Arush, may Hashem bless him always. Do you ever stop and think, what is your mission on being on earth? What is your purpose to be here? We talked about the fact that Hashem does everything, there's a purpose for everything, and that purpose is always for our ultimate best. So we must have a mission to be here. One of the most sad things to me of all is someone who lives their life, is born, lives their life, and dies, and has no idea why they were even here. Truly sad. We all have a mission. We all have a purpose. Rabbi Nachman says, on the day that you were born, the day that you were born, Hashem decided that the world could not survive without you. So you must have a mission. You must have a mission. Now we all know there are corrections we need to make. Corrections on an neshama from previous lifetimes, things that we've done wrong that we have to correct. But that's not a mission. A mission is something else, something that we take on ourselves as a responsibility that we want to make better, that we need to do, and as Rabbeinu says, that only we can do, each of us individually. So, here we have Shavuos coming up. <laughs> you knew I'd get to that, didn't you? I mean, you can't miss it, by the way. Chodesh Tov and uh, Chag Sameach. So Shavuos comes. Now Shavuos is mentioned in Torah, and it says that it was a, uh, a festival of harvest, a time of bikurim, of first fruits. That's most of the mention in Torah. However, nobody disputes the fact that Gomorrah holds very strongly and very consistently. It is also the anniversary of Matan Torah. It is the time of the giving of the Torah to the people of Israel. Now, how important is this? So, I want to read you something from a little book. I'm gonna, it's a very, very short part I'm going to read you. You know most of what children of Israel did to get ready for Matan Torah. This book is called The Book of Our Heritage by Eliyahu Kitov. It's exceptional. It goes month by month by month through the year, and it tells you about all the different things that were going through those months and how important they are. Now, it goes into all the things that we did. It goes into the fact that we came out of Egypt, and Hashem brought us to Har Sinai on the wings of eagles. We made it in a record time. Amazing. Then he says, he offers to us Torah. And what do we say? We say, Naseh v'nishma. Naseh v'nishma. Not nishma v'naseh. Not we hear and we will do. We will do and we will hear. In other words, we accept it upon ourselves without ever, having ever had a glimpse into what it was all about. What was the giving of Torah? How monumental of a thing was it? It was coming out of an age of barbarians to an age of civilization, of order, of purpose. This is huge. You know, in, in, in uh, the secular world, they talk about Renaissance. <laughs> the Renaissance was absolutely nothing compared to Matan Torah. This was exceptional. It took us to a new level, such a high level that we had special requirements. For example, we had to get ready three days ahead of time. Moshe Rabbeinu made it an extra day that we should be getting ready just to make sure we were prepared to receive this magnificent vehicle. You can't go but this far up on Mount Sinai or you'll be dead. So you have to stay back. You have to have respect. We have to be ritually pure. No relations with, between husbands and wives. No monkey business. We have to be clean. We have to be ready for this. This is an important, important thing. And as Eliyahu Kitov says in here, five days before the people of Israel received the Torah, one portion of it was addressed to them, which contains the essence of the Torah. It was therein expressed to them that the essential aim of the Torah is not alone to convey a collection of commanded deeds, words, or remembrances, but rather, this is very important, to enjoin the acceptance of a mission, we just talked about that, a mission on which the existence of the world depends. 
<laughs> pretty important stuff, huh? And an entrance into a service whose yoke could never be shed. We took it on ourselves forever, for us, for our children, for our children's children. It was so exciting, we built nothing on the mountain, ritual purity, no relations. We're excited, tomorrow's the day we're gonna get Torah, so we go right home and we, we go to sleep. Can you believe this? We go to sleep? We go to sleep? The most exciting thing that's ever happened in the world, and we go to sleep? If you ever wondered why we stay up all night, this would be a good view into why we do it. We are trying to make up for the gross mistake of taking it much, much too lightly. How could you go to sleep with such excitement ahead of you? How could you possibly close your eyes and, and not, not, not be sitting there wide awake going, I can't wait, I can't wait, I can't wait, I can't wait. This is what, you, this is what you'd be thinking. But no, we're sleeping. And don't say it. I know what you're thinking. I wasn't there. I didn't do it. Yes, you were. And yes, you did. It says we were all there. I was there. You were there. They were there. Everybody was there. We were all there. Because I just wanted to make sure we all took on the yoke of Torah. We all took it on as a mission to live this life and pass this life along to other people. And yet today we forget sometimes what our mission is. We get lost in all the shtiot around us, all the stupidity around us. You know, for years I was in business in America, and I found out one thing. I was actually a stockbroker with Merrill Lynch, a very big company there. And I'm going to tell you what I found out that people have money. Money does not make them happy. Some of them are the most miserable people you'd ever want to meet. They have bad health problems. They have problems show them by it. Their children don't even want to talk to them. They have lives that are really tough sometimes. Not only that, but they're never satisfied. They have a million dollars. They want five million. When they have five million, they want 10 million. When they have 10, they want 100. It never ends. There's never a place where they say, I'm happy. I'm satisfied, life is good. But Torah offers us that opportunity to do that. I want you just for a second to close your eyes. Close them, it's okay. And I want you to think about this. I want you to think about a beautiful spring day. The sky is blue. It's so blue you can hurt your eyes just to look at it. The clouds are white. There's just the slightest breeze blowing. Not too hot, not too cold, just bright. And we've all done this. And you go, oh, unbelievable. There's a feeling of happiness in that that cannot be replaced by money or things or anything at all. That's the happiness Hashem wants to give us. He doesn't want to give us responsibility that burden us. He's giving us things that will help us. The same way if you're, any of you are parents out there, you know this. You have children. You raise them. You don't always say yes to them. A lot of times you say no, and they cry. But you know, you know what's right for them. How many times do I see people, grown people, children of their own going, I would rather do this because this is more fun than doing that. Well, sure. That's what you think in your head right now. Just like your child thinks it'd be more fun to sit in a pile of candy and eat it till it's gone. Until his teeth rot and his stomach aches and his body shrivels because he's not getting proper nutrients. Of course, that's what he thinks. We're the same way. Only on a different level. We think it's the it's physical things. It's not physical things. No matter what physical things we do, it, it's not going to be the right thing. And I see people come to Israel and they love it. And they're here for two, three, four, five, six years. And then one day, they're not here. They went back to America, or England, or Australia, wherever they came from. And they say, I got tired of having to do all that stuff. So they go back to a different life, thinking they're gonna be happy. And they forget why they came here in the first place. And that's a big problem. We forget why we came here. We forget why we came into this world in the first place. We came here to do things, to change things, to fix things. But we don't remember that. And the angel touches us here as we're born, and we forget it. It's like the story of the man with the, with the candle maker. who's was a very poor candle maker and his wife. And they heard about a magical place where if you went there, there were diamonds everywhere. There were diamonds on the beach, diamonds on the street, diamonds on the sidewalks. You could pick them up to your heart's content. So they scrimped, and they saved. They saved. They finally bought one ticket to get there. And they got to this land, and sure enough, 
Diamonds were everywhere. He's picking him up and he's putting him in his knapsack and he's putting him in his pockets and anything he's got that can hold something. He's putting in all the, all the diamonds he can get. He gets done. He goes running back to the to the dock, but the ship has left that he came in on. And he says to them, "Where's the ship? Is it left? He said, "One will be back. Seven years. Seven years. Seven years." He resigns himself to the fact. He goes to a diner. He decides to have some something to eat. He has a bite to eat, a sumptuous meal, and he takes out a diamond and he puts it on the table. There you go, my good man. And the owner of the cafe looks at him and says, "You crazy? What am I going to do with this? There's diamonds everywhere. Diamonds are worthless here." He says, "Well, what am I going to do to pay you?" He says, "Well, do you have a trade?" The man says, "Yes, I, I make candles." He says, well, "That's great because we don't have no candle maker here, so you could be you could be our candle maker." So he starts making the candles. He does very well at it because there is no competition in town. So he's making candles like crazy. And he's counting down the days till he's going back. Finally, seven years comes and he goes and he packs all of his valuables in a sack and he runs to the dock. He gets on the boat and he goes home. His wife can hardly contain herself. She says, let me see what you brought. Let me see what you brought. And he opens the bag and he dumps it on the bed and it's a bag full of wax. What? Well, a bag full of wax? Why did you bring back wax? We have plenty of wax here. You went to get diamonds. Oh, you're right. I forgot. I completely forgot. I was doing so well with wax, I completely forgot about the diamonds. And folks, isn't that how we are? Sometimes we forget about the diamonds. And we take the wax with us because we forget our purpose in being here. We have a mission. We have to change things. We have to do things. We get back... We go back to America from Israel or to everywhere else we come from and we get the feeling and we will get the feeling after a while we forgot what our mission was. We decided to settle for wax instead of diamonds. My friends, as we go towards Shafur, don't forget your mission. Don't settle for wax when you can have diamonds. Oh, I should tell you the rest of the story. As she's cleaning his clothes, she finds a couple of small diamonds in the pocket. This is how Hashem is. He always gives us the hope that we can come back to what we need to be doing. Let's be doing that. Let's bring ourselves a life of joy, fulfillment, and love. And let's spread this joy to everyone we know to bring about the coming of Mashiach, Tzidkenu, and the building of the third Beit HaMikdash, Bimhei Rabbi Omenu. Have a great Shavuos. Have a great Shabbos. Have a great week. Chodesh Tov, all my friends. Be well.